Several years ago, I wrote a catalogue essay for a Tom Polo project here at Blacktown called Yes I Can, No Can Do, in which it was necessary to develop a sort of logic around a West-centric framework of presentation. In the research I did for the essay, uh, I came across a, a, a reference that Gough Whitlam had chosen Blacktown as the symbolic site to, to deliver the It's Time speech in 1972. And so, from my own memory of those times, I recall how transformative that election was. Uh, I don't so much, I wasn't really aware of how things had changed politically, but how culturally Australia was completely um, transformed. It was a different place. And so the premise of this was that um, Blacktown, not Botany Bay, was the founding loci of contemporary multicultural Australia. And so this, in, in writing the essay for Tom, I was uh, aware that there were several anniversaries related with that and that they both would be taking place in Blacktown and that it could be possible to construct a, a, a project that was parenthesised by, the, by these two speeches, the speech in 1972 and in 1974. In 1972, there had been, um, I think, uh, more than 23 years of conservative government in Australia. There had not been in my lifetime, or in the lifetime of the majority of Australians, a government other than that led by the Liberal National Party. Uh, E.G. Whitlam was the, Edward Gough Whitlam was the leader of the Labour opposition. He was able um, to reform the Labour Party, so to, but, but to keep its commitment, particularly a commitment that he shared individually, to greater equality, so a, a greater access to resources. So he, he came here because Blacktown for him was symbolic of all of those inequalities in Australian society, that you could come to Blacktown and by addressing the people of Blacktown, you could address directly those issues around poor transport, uh, bad education, miserable health care. And, and so this was a terribly extraordinary moment. Um, and he came here. So he was the first political leader in Australian history to identify the, the, the western suburbs of the big Australian cities, with the exception of Perth, where they're the eastern suburbs, as the crucible of Australian political and cultural identity. And so he returned in 1974. In the 18 months in which the, his first government last, lasted, they were unable to affect any legislation with the exception of one bill. They were blocked by a hostile Senate. Uh, so <coughs> he returned here in 1974 and he recommitted the party to reform. They won that election, and very shortly afterwards there was the, f still, the first and still only joint sitting of the houses of, the, both houses of the Australian Parliament, in which was enabled the legislation establishing Medicare, and a whole range of, the abolition of university fees, a whole range of things that really shaped a generation of Australians, and that now for the first time is being seriously unravelled. So it's a, it's a really appropriate moment to look um, at the, th the sudden retreat from commitment to equality of all of the political parties, the idea that somehow uh, th the answer to our questions is to lower the basic wage and, or the minimum wage and to withdraw benefits. Uh, and to, to affect the pretension that the burden is being shared equally when there are some of the most outrageous levels of profitability in the financial sector and the mining companies. So Whitlam identified all of these things, particularly the foreign ownership of Australian resources, as being potentially capable of destabilising the political processes in Australia, and he turned out to be right there. I suppose this, the, the feature that defines this exhibition is that um, we have all been very conscious of Whitlam's commitment to greater equality. Uh, and it's truly a magical um, idea that greater inequality will bring greater social, greater equality will bring gre greater social justice and inner and outer contentment. So the artists reflect that. So they have Simran Gill, who represented Australia in the last Venice Biennale, and Simran is exhibiting in the same cultural sp and physical space as a high street photographer from Blacktown whose business is the taking of photographs for weddings and parties. So we've endeavoured to look at that idea that um, art is for all and we've certainly tried to construct an exhibition that contests 
you know, that really boring hegemony of just a few artists who do everything in Australia, you know, and it's, so this show has Isabella and F uh, Alfredo Aquilizan, uh, Darren Bell, Grant Stevens, Deborah Kelly, The Kingpins, um, and myself, yes. The Anthony Barberi works feature portraits of people who were present in 1972 or 1974 in Blacktown for those two speeches. So a research assistant working here at the gallery was able to identify several individuals and follow them up and then link them with Anthony Barberi and they came to his photographic studio and they posed for pictures. And the really magical thing is that two of those people were later married. I mean, later, subsequent to the, the 1972 election campaign, not having been photographed by Anthony. The work of Deborah Kelly's is a banner that is very dramatically in suspension, halfway between heaven and earth, uh, as though cast there by fleeing billionaires as they scurry away from their social responsibilities. The work features a text that says, the billionaires united will never be defeated. And uh, stitched on the O of billionaire is in fact a real diamond. So it, th the staging of it within the gallery suggests that um, it has been tossed aside as the billionaires flee from, scru from the scrutiny of the tax authorities, perhaps, or from the very idea that they should bear their fair share of the burden. Uh, it, it refers to Deborah's long-term commitment to ideas and programs around social justice. And it's on a gorgeous uh, double-sided velvet with gold trimming. So, and dark pole, so it has all of the authenticity of those old trade union banners. So this is a very interesting, ironical play. The work of the Kingpins uh, is a riff on Auntie Jack. Auntie Jack was one of the, the, the song Farewell Auntie Jack was the highest selling Australian single in the top 40 charts of 1974, the year that Whitlam returned to the Australian public to have his mandate re-endorsed. So it's a, it's a mashup um, of uh, a series of faces, rather in a, in a manner that the Kingpins really did pioneer in Australian video art. Uh, where they would photograph themselves upside down and composite, composite faces. I mean, they draw a lot from a uh, vaudeville tradition, and so it's a mashup of uh, Farewell Auntie Jack and, and the Whitlam speeches, uh, emphasizing the use of the word time and timely, and it's time. Uh, my work is a double portrait of Gough Whitlam and Deng Xiaoping. Uh, and it's in an atrophied artisanal technique called uh, Pietra Dura. It's an extraordinarily time-consuming technique and process, and I suppose there are very few possibilities left to artists to critique power, and one of them is really the time that they spend. So I've, I have a great deal of respect for, 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 for labour, uh, and I suppose as an artist, I also have a huge respect for those practices that are difficult, that are technically uh, demanding, and that are durational. They also, in this particular instance, a high-end art form. Pietro Dura is arguably the most valuable um, art form that there is. The most ex ex expensive objects of art traded in the last 10 years are these extraordinary cabinets made up of precious stones and inlay. So, in that sense, yes, it's to use that um, because these are just they're on a sticky back adhesive, so they're applied to the wall and they're destroyed when you have to remove them. So it, it inhibits, in in so much as it's possible, the quick reduction of a work to commodity exchange and tries to foreground what is its cultural value above its material value, and it uh, it endeavours to say that. Um, there is a really, really important place for difficult and time-consuming practices in contemporary art, and that to ex that it's one of the f to have a practice of this sort is one of the few possibilities that an artist has available to them to really contest those sorts of 
um, uh, the co-option of, of art by the system of capital. I think there's a good segue to the types of stone which have been sampled and then from that I guess you talk about the portrait sitters themselves. And Pietro Dura involved um, the replacement of the, the tonal and chromatic values of a painting normally uh, that you would send to the, the to Theo della Petrodura in Florence and the artisans there would replace them over time, it would take years with precious and hard stones. In this case I've photographed the stone uh, in sites of, of associated with the figures so that it's possible to develop secondary and tertiary narrative layers. So the, f the stone is photographed in Old Parliament House in Canberra uh, and at the Forbidden Palace in Beijing. Additional stone samples are from St Paul's College, at Sydney University and at various other places. And so in, in them in these, I have endeavoured to, uh, to suggest something of that erasure of the personality that all great people have to go through in order to become the public figure that they are. So in the portrait on the right hand side, only those two indexes of, of, of who the person really is in, in, in their features, their eyes and their lips are there. It's a technique derived from theatre, but also uh, my familiarity with it came through the practice of Lee Bowery who would black himself out in order to erase his personality and it references an essay by T.S. Eliot in which he talks about the, the, that people erase themselves in order to become someone else and in this case we don't really ever know who a great person is because they have been so careful to conceal who they really are. So in the second there is, a, I've filled in some generalised features, it's a way of addressing I suppose that sort of inscrutability around all public figures, particularly the way they overwrite their own features in order that you don't really see who they are. The portrait images are taken from a photograph of uh, Mr and Mrs Whitlam visiting China on the first official visit by an Australian Prime Minister. And they have the same relationship in these restaged photographs that they have in the original. And the original is of course black and white, so I've, I've addressed that what are the formal properties of the original image by resorting to, to basically a, a, a field of just obsidian and porphyry. And I suppose the anonymity and the, 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 the act of concealment and the invisibility of the features in the, the, the portrait on my right addresses something of that, the this, this sort of uh, the great lengths to which individuals are obliged to go in order to occupy high office. So irrespective, this is true both of Whitlam and Deng Xiaoping. And it enabled, I suppose, uh, f uh, the leverage of a greater discussion about um, how we remember and what we remember. Normally, I think we remember just a few salient aspects of an individual. And in that, there's also the loop between the viewer. There is a feedback loop. The viewer looks at Deng, who looks at Whitlam, who looks back at them. So this feedback loop is, I suppose, a, an, a, firstly, it's a formal property. It's a compositional device. But it incorporates the viewer into the, 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 the visual discourse between both Whitlam and Deng, but also between history and memory and um, forgetfulness and it, uh, it then just repeats and re plays back and plays back and plays back.